fusion power is, has, and always will be 30 years away. At least that's what it feels like sometimes. Maybe we should just give up. But what if I told you there was a way? What if I told you that the thorium economy could aid in the development of the highest density energy source in the solar system? That's what I want to talk about. I'm Sean Kenny. This is Rock Logic. Hello and welcome back to Rock Logic. I am your host, Sean Kenny, and today is a very exciting day. I've been waiting to record this episode for weeks now because I came across a discovery. A discovery that excites the hell out of me because it may actually achieve something that up to this point, I could only dream about. Now, you may be wondering what that is, and I will get to that in a moment, but right now, I need to give you some context. You see, for as long as I can remember, I've been obsessed with energy production, and if you've been watching the show long enough, you probably know which means I favor the most. For 10 years, I've been convinced that, beyond a reasonable doubt, that thorium breeder reactors, specifically the lifter, is the end-all be-all solution for all of our planet's energy needs. I have said it time and time again that if we adopt lifter as the solution, then humanity is going to make it. We will accomplish a utopian future by unlocking uh, one of the most affordable and abundant energy sources known to man. So what else is there to talk about? Well, there is one energy source that will trump fission reactors like Lifter by several orders of magnitude, and that's called nuclear fission. For those of you who are not aware of the distinct differences between the two, uh, allow me to go into some detail. Fission is the act of splitting apart atoms of the most dense elements of the periodic table of elements, so thorium, uranium, plutonium, to achieve a million times more energy density than that of a carbon-hydrogen bond. The science behind it is well understood, it's in common practice today, and it can be achieved more efficiently with the adoption of new technologies and methods. Fusion is the act of taking the lightest elements in the periodic table of elements, like helium and hydrogen, and combining them together to achieve confinement. Once you've achieved this, you are able to achieve a larger amount of energy density than that of fission. Uh, it can be done very safely with zero emissions and with little to no waste to speak of. Sounds great, but like with everything else, there's a catch. Though we don't have reactors that are in operation today, there is a valid proof uh, that it can be achieved. We know this because the sun does it every day. So with that logic, if the sun can do it, uh, then we should be able to do the same thing, right? Well, not exactly. You see, the sun can fuse helium and hydrogen effectively because it can achieve confinement through a very large gravity well. Being the largest celestial body in the solar system has its perks, but you can't achieve fusion in that way on this planet. It's just not possible. So in an attempt to replicate this, we have experimented with the possibility of achieving this through electromagnetism by way of a tokamak. It's basically a large electromagnetic device uh, that can confine plasma to achieve controlled fusion create a powerful enough field, and we can achieve our dreams. Though we have achieved fusion at a laboratory scale, it hasn't been done very effectively. You see, for every unit of energy that we put into it, uh, we only get about a third of that energy back. It's not a very appealing business case, and we want to achieve at least uh, an inverse of that, or maybe even get tenfold efficiency if possible. Now, for more than three decades, uh, an international consortium of American, Japanese, and European nations have been collaborating on the development of ITER, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. The goal of this experiment is to achieve controlled fusion uh, on a large scale and to demonstrate the uh, feasibility of fusion power. After going back and forth on where they were going to put the damn thing, they finally broke ground this summer. Best guess Yes, at the pace they're going, construction won't end until about 2025, and we'll never see the achievement of fusion until sometime in the mid-2030s. If they succeed, they will do so using outmoded tech and approaches we could have applied back in the 1990s for a cost of about $50 billion. Now, if we had to rely on world governments to achieve this, I don't think we'd get very far. Thankfully, there have been a number of fusion energy startups popping up around North America over the last 15 years. These are privately funded companies with ambitions to change the way we think about energy production. Though they all have unique designs and approaches to achieving controlled fusion, one company stands out in my mind as being able to achieve this within the next five years. 
The company is called Commonwealth Fusion and their design is the ARC reactor. Commonwealth was founded by some of the best and brightest minds that MIT has to offer. And even though the company founded in 2018, they have already received about $250 million in private money uh, investments from VCs and multinational energy conglomerates. These guys are definitely onto something big and clearly they have an approach that trumps what everyone else is doing. So what could that possibly be to raise a quarter billion dollars in private investment? investment in less than two years. You see, the IDER plans on using big, bulky, low temperature superconducting magnets with a vast amount of expensive copper wiring. The ARC reactor uses small, lighter, rare earth, uh, high temperature superconducting magnets to achieve confinement. The efficiency of these rare earth magnets allow the ARC to achieve fusion as if it was a reactor four times its size. The smaller size reduces construction costs by a significant order of magnitude. Another great thing about the ARC is that it does away with the solid blanket materials altogether and replaces it with a blanket of fly, fluoride, lithium, beryllium, molten salt. This is the same coolant and fuel solvent that's uh, used in molten salt reactors like the lifter. Not only does this reduce maintenance costs, but it achieves four vital functions that allow uh, the reactor to work at the highest level of efficiency. Fly uh, salt cools the inner core and prevents it from overheating. It protects the outer wall from neutron radiation damage. It converts high temperature plasma into usable heat for energy conversion. And FLIB also has the advantage of absorbing neutrons to make more tritium, which fuels the reactor. Now, the company plans on demonstrating the Rebco magnet technology to validate their work by next year, prototype is expected to be operational by the year 2025. And after successfully completing those milestones, we could see commercial fusion reactors in circulation long before the government-funded behemoth known as ITER comes online. This in and of itself is exciting, but what really got me excited is the potential of this tech working in synergy with Lifter. As I mentioned earlier, the same flybe salt that this reactor uses is the same material that is uh, required to cool and power the Lifter. As of today, there is no existing supply chain for FLIB or the enriching of lithium-7 to make it. Why? Because neither ARC or Lifter are currently in operation or in circulation for commercial use today. But what if they were? To make highly efficient magnets uh, in the ARC reactor, you need rare earth materials. If you watched episode four, and if you haven't, I'll link it in the description below, you know that there already is a national precedent to develop a domestic rare earth uh, mining manufacturing supply chain in this country. To achieve this, we need to establish a co-op to store the waste thorium from these mines and to develop markets and uses for it. Doing so will fund the commercial development of Lifter and the materials and supply chain to support this industry. This includes the mass production of flyb salt and the Brayton cycle gas turbines that will convert high temperature heat into energy. All of this taken into consideration, we see that the supply chain will directly uh, benefit the development of the ARC reactors. So we won't have a scenario in which ARC trumps lifter or vice versa. Instead, the two technologies will complement each other seamlessly and where we get the best of both worlds. Large urban areas will take advantage of the higher fuel density of fusion energy to power cities. Smaller, more compact lifters can power developing countries, small cities and villages, as well as smaller remote areas. The process the prospect of controlled fusion being achieved near term gets me really excited because even though fission can handle the task of powering our world in spades, fusion answers the uh, question, what's next? Fusion's higher energy density per unit mass makes it highly appealing uh, in off-world applications, like powering space colonies and interstellar spacecraft that can travel at 10% the speed of light. Doing so means we can reach star systems like Alpha Centauri within five decades as opposed to 50,000 years. And who knows, we may be able to achieve other applications that I haven't even gone over in this show, but that will be a topic for another day. For now, I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic. Hey, thank you so much for uh, watching today's episode. Uh, we're a new podcast, so we really appreciate if you like this video and subscribe to it. My producer, Jessica, says that I'll get a cookie uh, for every new subscriber we get. Maybe if I'm good enough, she'll let me outside. Is that good? Yeah, all right. Hmm. That's good. That's a good cookie.